Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Alexandra Campbell. I'm the executive director for the Reston Historic Trust Am Museum. And the museum is located at Lake Am Plaza and our mission is to preserve the past, inform the present and influence the future of Reston through programs such as tonight. Uh, so please note we are recording tonight's presentation and uh, if you have questions as we go through, uh, please uh, take a note of them and we will be taking questions at the end. So tonight we are commemorating First Lady Claudia Johnson, also known as Lady Bird Johnson's visit to Reston on July 13th, 1967, which was 54 years ago today. We'll begin with a special guest tonight um, who will be talking about Lady Bird, and then we will be sharing resources from our archives, as well as the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library that focus on her visits to Reston specifically, and this is going to include some audio from Lady Bird herself, so we have a real treat planned for the evening. I am very happy to introduce author Julia Swig. She's an award-winning author on books on Cuba, Latin America, and American foreign policy. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, Foreign Affairs, The Nation, and many more. She holds a doctorate and a master's degree from John Hopkins University. And she is a non-resident senior research fellow at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin, and lives with her family outside of the Washington, DC. Uh, she is author of Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight, which was published earlier this year and which she will be sharing with us. So without further ado, we're gonna get started and I'm gonna turn it over to Julia. I'm gonna spotlight her for everybody. There we go. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me, Alexandra. Thanks for reaching out to me to participate in this discussion tonight. Um, I, as you mentioned, am the author of a book called Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight, as most authors do. I, you can see it in my Zoom background. Um, and this book is a, an attempt to recast Lady Bird inside and at the center of the LBJ presidency. And the reason I wanna start with this photograph is because the, um, the Johnson era is one that is dominated in terms of the way the story is told by the president, by Lyndon Johnson. We'll see a slide later on that'll um, give some more detail, but this image for me, I like very much because it shows you the two of them at the ranch in Texas on Christmas 1963. So this is just a little bit over a month after the JFK assassination in Dallas. And what the book argues and what the resource material in the book shows is just how entirely commingled the Johnson enterprise was between what I call the two LBJs, Lyndon Baines Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson. In this image, what you see is Lyndon sitting down, looking up at Lady Bird, Lady Bird in the command position and the power position, looking down at him. Um, and you see two people who are very much connected to one another. And at this moment in their very young presidency coming at at the back of this horrific tragedy. What they're trying to do is solidify a national narrative through their context in the media that Lyndon Johnson is somebody who does have the capacity to unify the country. Um, so I start with this image for you because it really flips the script. And I think what we think of in as more of a, or have thought of as more of a two dimensional first lady where we see her often as we see other first ladies in depicted visually in, a, in two dimensions and often her substance sort of limited to ceremonial activities standing by her man, but being quite subordinate and lacking in substance 
and policy chops. And we're here tonight talking about something. So the first point that I wanna make about Lady Bird Johnson is that she and Lyndon had a very much commingled enterprise through the course of their 30 years plus of marriage, both a marriage enterprise, a political enterprise, a financial enterprise through their media business. Um, we're here tonight to talk about Reston and I was really delighted that Alexandra reached out to me because the second kind of myth that, that I try to debunk in this book and that Lady Bird's own source material very much strips away at is to talk about what she's most associated with, which is beautification. That term that is associated with her is often one that we think of related to highway beautification, the planting of flowers, or certainly the gorgeous spring blossoms that come up in the Washington area around the National Mall and around um, tour tourism parts of Washington, D.C. every spring. Um, and you who are residents, of course, would know this because we see it every year. But Beautification was a word, a euphemism that she actually really hated and that disguised and concealed, just as she disguised and concealed her significant power, disguised and concealed a much more uh, integrated and comprehensive, and I would say even pioneering and radical environmental agenda. Lady Bird's environmentalism by 1967 is a lot more, ex when she visits Reston, is a lot more explicit than it was earlier in her time um, um, in the White House. And if you want, you can go to the next slide, Alexandra. There we go. Um, one of the things and the reason I use the word talk about power when associated not with Lyndon, not just with Lyndon, but with Lady Bird, is that she has, she demonstrated an enormous capacity to convene power and to do so in the service of an effort na nationwide, but really focused on Washington DC that tried to unpack the idea of beautification and reveal it as kind of a marriage of environmental justice and civil rights. And this is a person who had grown up, she lost her mother when she was five years old and she speaks often, spoke often about the solace that she took from having access to nature. And what she's trying to do in this photograph and in Washington DC, and we'll see it in another slide too, but don't go there yet, is convene source resources of power in order to try to bring greater access to nature and recreation to the residents of, de of Washington DC. Now this photo is somewhat um, deceptive because, and the reason I have it here is, not so much so you can see the model of the National Mall, although it's a very cool model. That's the more conventional space where her beautification efforts, that her beautification efforts are associated with. But it's the people in this picture who played, whom she convened, who played a very important role in this effort to try to show that access to nature for the most disenfranchised of American citizens in what was at the time the largest black majority city of the country, Washington DC, one that had no representation in Congress, no mayor, no city council, no tax revenue that it was able to draw upon um, and an enormous amount of segregation. What she's doing here with these people, what's more important than the model is the people. And if you see to one of them who is on her left, that's Lawrence Rockefeller, who is an important environmentalist, very influential in her thinking. On her right, another one who's very important, Stuart Udall, the Secretary of Interior. Udall was friends with Rachel Carson. She, Lady Bird comes into the White House right after Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring. Udall is a very comprehensive environmentalist too. And right behind Udall, with the man who's gesturing and has a beard, um, over Udall's right shoulder is Lawrence Halperin. He becomes one of Lady Bird's most important partners in trying to think about how to mobilize federal resources for to build up access to nature in American cities for communities of color, especially. Communities of color who in Washington and in 300 other cities around the country 
by way of context for her visit to Reston, have had experienced massive dislocation as a result of urban renewal programs in the 40s and 50s. So they're now in, in this photograph, I believe this is 1965, taking a look at how with Udall's, um, as Secretary of Interior, who runs the National Park Service, how along the Anacostia River, which is a place that of enormous green space, there can be federal dollars deployed both to desegregate it actively via creating public recreation for the black residents of Washington. So if you go to the next slide, this image um, comes from the Penn Architecture Library at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I don't know if you can blow it up at all, Alexandria, Alexandra, a little bit, or if you can on your own screens at home. But um, this is an image that is from, let me see, it says it, you have to remember. Does it have the date? Well, it's 1967, I believe, same time that of, as Lady Bird's trip out to, to Reston. Now, those of you who know Washington, D.C. can recognize there what was in 1968 named RFK Stadium, the stadium on the bottom left quadrant. This is a model of a mock-up of a master plan that Lady Bird raised money from a variety of philanthropists to finance Lawrence Halprin to develop a vision for Washington, D.C. of the nature that I just described. And um, you can see that in the top left quadrant, there's a something called Swimming Lake. Her big project, and I think some of you probably know Kingman Island today, the focal point for Lady Bird, who was a devoted swimmer herself, was to convert Kingman Island, which is in this spit that's sort of connected to the Anacostia River into a giant swimming hole, surrounded by, as you can see, cultural center, boating lake, the stadium, the National Arboretum, and all kinds of other sort of community-based ways to be in nature for local DC residents. This is a, 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 an idea that brings together, as I said, integration and civil rights and great society and mobilizing federal resources for the common good and all in the context of the Johnson administration's, I think, very understudied environmentalism. This image um, looks very much like an image that I found um, of the current DC government's plan to develop this very area along the Anacostia River only 50 years later to the tune of $500 million or more, it obviously is, is, a, is a work in progress. Um, I give this to you because I think it, it should help you understand why her trip to rest, the context for her trip to rest in. This obviously never materialized during the Johnson presidency because as you know, by 1968, he announces that he's going to um, not run for a second term. Vietnam has destroyed his presidency, American cities are, are in open revolt, and the Johnsons announced that he won't run for a, a final term. Um, there's another huge story inside of this story about the defeat by Washington residents of a network of, of highways that was going to run right through the district. We can talk about it in the Q&A if you like, that's part of this. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's one of the huge surprises about Lady Bird Johnson along with her overall power and influence with Lyndon that is revealed in um, the source material underlying the book. So if you can go to the next slide, Alexandra. Um, Lady Bird Johnson, this is her in her private office. Um, this had been Jackie's dressing room, but Lady Bird redecorated it. And as you can see, she's sitting and she's recording her audio diary. She left 123 hours of audio recordings. They begin with her experience of the assassination of JFK on November 22nd, 1963. And they end on January 31, 1969, once the Johnsons are back at the ranch in Texas and the Nixons are the next, are, are in the White House. She was a history major and a journalism major. And I think that's very important to understand that she had her eye on not only legacy,
but on recording in real time what she was experiencing in the White House. And you can see if you zoom in a little bit on your own screens or otherwise, that those manila envelopes are labeled one for each day. Her staff would collect press clips and internal documents and her daily diary, meaning her agenda, Lyndon Johnson's and all kinds of other material. And this is a woman who you'll hear when you hear her speak is capable of incredible synthesis of a lot of material. She has a almost a photographic memory. And so over these 123 hours or 1,753,000 words of transcripts, she was able to document her own experience in the White House, which is an enormous contribution, one that um, I think really sets the bar for future first spouses or the current first spouse, and one that um, has been until now essentially missed and missed be for lots of reasons. One reason is that she was very careful to present herself in a certain way while she was in office. And second, because when we most um, most presidential history focuses on the president and 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 maybe the guys in the Oval Office around him, but less so about, in, with a few exceptions, less so that on um, the the partnership at the center. And in this presidency, that partnership was extremely important. And she left us the record and the breadcrumbs to be able to show it now. So with that, I will. Um, wait for your questions, but turn this back over to Alexandra. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh, just uh, the context for who she is is just really sets us up really great. And I know I, I certainly myself did not know a lot about Lady Bird Johnson before really diving into this topic. And so it's really fascinating to learn about her as a person and to see, um, as we'll see, all the parallels with, with Reston and Reston's development. So thank you. Great. Of course, thank you. Okay, so I'll get ahead and we'll talk um, a little bit before we get to her visit, we will talk a little bit about some other parallels between the Johnsons and Reston that are just interesting to, to note. Um, so uh, for Reston's dedication uh, in 1966, so before Lady Bird Johnson's visit, President Johnson actually sent a message to uh, Restonians. And so he said, uh, in this age of ever mounting urban growth, the birth of a new town such as Reston is a living influence which invigorates our concepts of urban planning. I extend greetings to you all as you dedicate the city of Reston. And so you can see here on the slide, this is a photograph of Simon speaking at the dedication. And uh, at this dedication, he was also presented with a United States flag, uh, which is shown here, which had been flown over the Capitol. Uh, later that same year, uh, Simon would also uh, attend a state dinner. Um, it, he's noted as one of the attendees um, in the president's daily diary. There we go. Uh, under uh, the Johnson administration, the U.S. also made impressive gains in the space program, and Reston has two schools, um, Aldrin and Armstrong, which are named after the Apollo 11 astronauts. And uh, as has already been discussed, uh, Lady Bird Johnson's environmental campaigns are another parallel with Reston. Uh, one of Reston's founding principles is that uh, beauty, both structural and natural, uh, natural, would be fostered. And so this, of course, included creating lakes, preserving open green space, and having neighborhoods conform to the landscape. Um, there's also always been an emphasis on trails and making Reston walkable, which also creates very easy access to nature as well. And so now we're going to discuss her visit. Um, so here on the slide here, this is uh, the written account, um, Lady Bird Johnson's uh, daily diary. So it notes that she arrived in Reston just after 1, uh, 120. And uh, she would stay there until um, almost, uh, or just a little bit after three o'clock. Uh, and so 
When she traveled uh, to Reston, she noted in her audio diary that July was a time that she put aside for things that she personally wanted to do. She considered it a self-indulgence month. And so at the July of 1967, she said that she wanted to visit Reston. She was aware of new towns and was aware that Reston was one of them. And so she wanted to see it. And so she, she did. Uh, she was greeted uh, when she arrived by founder Robert E. Simon Jr. And you can see her pictured here with Simon and on her left is Jane Wilhelm, who was the director of community services at Reston. And so Simon started off their visit by talking a little bit about what Reston was all about. He said that 80,000 were planned to live in Reston by 1980. And at the time that she was visiting in 1967, about 2,000 Restonians were in Rest, uh, lived in Reston. Uh, they talked about how they could walk everywhere um, in Reston at the time, that it was a very walkable community and they spent most of their trip walking. Uh, Lady Byrne noted that the, uh, she said, uh, the acreage is rolling wooded hills and open grassy meadows. So she instantly picked up on uh, Reston's focus on nature. Uh, Simon was also attracted to the area here for similar reasons for, for the nature that the area had. Uh, later in life, um, he reflected on his first visit to the area before he purchased the property. And he said, it was attractive, beautiful land, half of it woods, half pasture. Walking through fields and seeing the woods persuaded me that I would be wise to take on this fabulously located offering. And so he and Lady Bird have very similar ideas of, uh, and uh, describe it in a very similar way. Uh, in her audio diary, Lady Bird also talks about how uh, she says you could turn children loose. And she noted that as they entered Reston, they saw a little boy on, the bi on a bicycle riding past them. And they, they almost thought that maybe he had been planted there by Simon to demonstrate um, how easily kids could get around and how safe the neighborhood was and everything. And so while this may or may not be the exact uh, moment that uh, she's talking about, it is captured here in this photograph. We'll see in a couple more slides, uh, a lot of children end up uh, learning about her visiting and, and come to meet her. But um, this describes what she talks about in her audio diary very well. Uh, Lady Bird also notes uh, five characteristics of Reston, and so uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to let her talk about it. Uh, so I'm going to play this for you. So some audio is incoming. And economically integrated. Oh. The incomes of fat. Oh. Third, there were a Hold great on. Looks like we got a little ahead of ourselves in the audio recording. economic third let's try it from here I'm do it from the beginning the first and characteristic automobile go. is very much relegated to a secondary place people walk here the second, second characteristic is both racially integrated and economically integrated the incomes of families living here range from five thousand a year to over fifty thousand and to suit this clientele, the dwellings range from small apartments that rent for 125 a month through duplexes, townhouses, row houses to me, to individual homes ranging to about 60,000. Third, there were a great many amenities. There were already three swimming pools for this 2,000 population, all in loud and happy use as we passed. One golf course, which Mr. Simon said there's always a waiting line. The community house where they have jukeboxes, a pool table, and dancing space for the teenagers. A movie once a week. A very nice library. Fourth characteristic, the commercial area of shops itself is laid out with great charm and imagination around a man-built lake. 
except that it's so clean and fresh, it rather reminds me of one of those European towns built on a canal, Amsterdam or Copenhagen. It's an outdoor cafe with striped awnings and bright flowers, and a walking bridge that arches over the lake, and it all has a gay sort of a country club atmosphere. The innovative planner had put the laundromat right next to the little art gallery and right across from the library. Fifth characteristic, there's also some industry. And so uh, those are some really interesting insights into restaurant from Lady Bird. And what's interesting is that it connects very well with Reston's founding principles to have housing for all, um, and also talking about European towns, uh, Lake Anne in particular was influenced um, by Portofino and its design. And so uh, she really captures a lot of the founding of Reston and, and what, um, what kind of community Simon wanted to create. And so as she mentioned um, uh, in the audio we just heard is that she visited um, where Reston's industry was, which was also another aspect of Reston's founding principle that Restonians could live and work within the same community. And so uh, by 1967, we have several businesses that have um, come to Reston and are in providing employment. Um, and so, uh, at the time of her visit, Mrs. Johnson specifically notes that um, industries included Singer Brother, Motorola, uh, featured here on the slide here, and uh, this is uh, the specifically the building that was in Reston, uh, Scope, and other industries as well. During her visit, uh, Lady Bird Johnson would also visit uh, Lake Ann Elementary School. And that ties into uh, uh, the National Head Start program. So in 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson had declared a war on poverty in a State of the Union address. Uh, this, and one of the initiatives that came out of that was the Head Start program, which is still around today. And it provides preschool to children of low income families. Uh, during her time as First Lady, uh, Lady Bird Johnson would serve as the honorary chairman of the National Head Start Program. In this particular image here, this is uh, Lady Bird reading to a Head Start Program. And we also have, uh, this is a program that's in our archives of the dedication of Lake Ann Elementary School. And so when she visited the school, she would also visit uh, the Head Start classroom as well. And while uh, Johnson had planned this trip to be uh, more of a private tour, um, just her and Simon and Mr. Fortas, uh, word spread very quickly that she had arrived. We've seen in the photographs and the number of people that have come out to see her. And also uh, with these newspaper articles, it, uh, it was uh, publicized as well in the Reston Times, the Washington Post and the Dulles Herndon newspaper as well. Uh, before she left, she was presented with several gifts, which included a book about Reston, a toy for Patrick Linden, and a watercolor drawing. Uh, Mr. Ford has received an ashtray, and all of these items were either uh, created by Restonians or were from Reston shops. Uh, she ended her visit by saying that Reston was a lively, vital place. Uh, she described it as a look into the future, and there was much that was good about it, especially the beautiful forest and meadow setting. Uh, she would return to DC to welcome di uh, uh, diplomatic wives for tea, uh, where she would mention her visit to them. And so with that, that this is our commemoration of Mrs. Johnson's visit. Um, however, if you would like something a little bit more tangible, the rest of the museum is currently selling in our gift shop, um, the White House Christmas ornament, which this year celebrates the Johnsons um, and particularly focuses on Lady Bird as well. Um, on the back side are flowers, um, and a quote um, that were inspired by Lady Bird Johnson's beautification programs. I also have, of course, um, I've been enjoying uh, Julia Swig's um, book. Oops, it's not quite coming up. So 
And I was able to obtain my copy locally um, from Squirrel Books if you're looking to read the book. And there is also a podcast if you would rather listen uh, and learn more about Lady Bird Johnson um, titled um, In Plain Sight Lady Bird Johnson. So you can find that as well. And so before uh, we get to questions, I do wanna just uh, note a few resources. Uh, so the photographs that we showed today, many of them um, are in our collection at the Reston Museum and we have several on display in a temporary case. So if you have time, uh, please come down and uh, you can view the photographs in person. Uh, and then I'll put in the chat in a minute as we're getting into questions, a link to the audio diary uh, that uh, was referenced for this program. And um, also I encourage you to check out um, the Lyndon B. Johnson uh, Library uh, resources as well if you wanna learn more about Lady Bird. And so I wanna, before we open up to questions, this again, to thank Julia for joining us tonight and, and sharing with us all about uh, Lady Bird. And, um, and now we'll open it up to questions. So let's see. Does anybody have any any questions for us? I was just wondering if Julia could tell us more about what happened to the plans that Lady Bird had and what obstacles they encountered. Yes, I'd be happy to. You're talking about the Anacostia plans? Right, so you know there was a, a moment in the history of Washington DC in the 1960s when, and this was the case going back to the interstate highway systems birth in the 1950s. There was a moment when there was a big push to build freeways through almost every quadrant of Washington, D.C. Stretching from, there was one that would have gone like pretty much up Wisconsin Avenue, one that would have gone across kind of a long military road driving right into Tacoma Park, D.C. I live in Tacoma Park, Maryland, so just two blocks from here. Um, the Beltway, the idea was to bring it in closer to the center of the city. And there was a particular other, one of the others was called the East Leg of the Beltway. And that was, it's unbuilt. All of these are unbuilt. But this particular one was going to run right through Kingman Island and the Anacostia River, kind of from the, the stadium. And so there was a big, kind of, it, one of the only issues that unified black Washington and white Washington in the 1960s was to keep these highways out. And it's actually a wonderful story. And there was major citizen mobilization around it. And Lady Bird kind of quietly helped to convey the objections of people in the cabinet, including Stu Udall and uh, others to LBJ, the long and the short of it is the highway was never built, but the plan was that Larry Halpern cooked up with Stu Udall and Lady Bird was to actually move the East Leg Highway so that it would not blow up the Kingman Island vision that they had and to run it basically just under the stadium. I mean, that would have just been preposterously expensive, but that was the plan to move it. Um, there was a highway transportation bill that at the end of 1968, LBJ came under a lot of pressure from his cabinet and from Lady Bird and from citizen movements to veto. He didn't veto it because he felt like he was getting out and he didn't wanna do things by fiat having come from the Congress and having a certain amount of respect for the Congress. But his signing statement basically was a hold your nose signing statement saying that this is an environmental disaster and um, a few years later through court efforts, Judge John J. Sirica threw out the whole thing. And you know, it was contested 
the trade-off that the Congress was pushing was that we, we won't give DC money for the Metro unless you build these highways. And so through the court challenges, ultimately going when Sirica was in the, uh, the DC federal court, he, he put a stop in about, I think I'm gonna get it wrong, but like before 73, once the, the Johnsons were gone. The plans also were so ambitious that really to leaving the highway issue aside to develop as much as what you saw in that image would have taken a couple of decades and billions of dollars. Um, and the political will was just beginning to be palpable in any case. I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, Thank you. Were, was Lady Bird ever to get anything built to uh, serve the lower income population of Washington, even if she didn't get Kingman Island built? Well, she did smaller projects in at schools in Northeast and in Northwest and in uh, an area called Syfax, which is sort of adjacent to where the new baseball stadium is now, where she and Kay Graham raised money to sort of do kind of more lighter touch um, beautifying, but it was all about sort of getting kids to participate and to have feel a sense of ownership over their physical spaces. Um, but that's as far as it went in DC. Uh, Lawrence Rockefeller put some money into cleaning up um, a big strip of a, a tributary of the Anacostia River in Southeast that she kind of gave some of her time to, but her big, and, and she and Walter Washington were focused on the schools, but with Kay Graham, but the most ambitious project was so outsized compared to the school projects. Well, that one excerpt from her diary about her visit to Reston was so detailed. Uh, I guess you must have drawn on the diary for your work. Uh, oh, I drew heavily on it, heavily, because it is, you take that and multiply it by, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages, thousands of pages. The diary is caused, you know, just was a page turner in itself because there's so much material about her substance and her influence on LBJ. Hmm. Uh, was it, a, then it was a transcribed? You didn't just have to listen? Yes, correct. Thank, say, thankfully, I mean, having to listen to it, it's, it's not a have to, but that would have been enormously time, time consuming. I read it all first. And then as I found material that I knew I wanted to quote and incorporate, I went and listened to it because it's so wonderful to hear her East Texas lilt and because she can go from the sublime to the ridiculous in a nanosecond and just, she's very enticing to listen to. That's why Alexandra, thanks for mentioning the podcast. We produced an eight episode audio documentary which tells the story of her time in the White House. You can hear her do that and my narration and a bunch of other contemporary, contemporary archival material. And it's quite compelling. Could you say the name of your book and the reference to the podcast again? The book is I called. Lost some of, of oh, my sorry. For a while. The book is called Lady Bird Johnson: Hiding in Plain Sight. Mm -hmm. Alexandra, is it available at the Reston Museum? We do not oh, have it. Gift shop. The, yeah, we don't have it at the museum, but um, Scrawl Books at Reston Town Center does have it. Okay, great. And then the yeah. podcast, which you can get on any podcast platform is called In Plain Sight, Lady Bird Johnson. And that's season one of a series I'm doing on women who we thought we knew, but we really don't know. Right, thank you. Sure. Uh, Julia, can I, oh, mm -hmm. hi. Um, could I ask where, where is the audio of her diary? Is it at the National Archives or at the LBJ Library? It's at the LBJ Library and it's um, pretty easy to navigate not, it's not a seamless process, but right now every entry shows up alongside its transcription. So you can listen to her and see the transcription. And it's kind of cool because she went through after the audio tapes were transcribed, which she started while she was still in the White House to transcribe them. And she marks them up. So you can see her, her handwriting and her marginalia while you're listening to it and reading it. 
Yeah, and I put the direct link to the specific audio diary um, in the chat that deals with Reston. So you can kind of start there and then go off exploring. So that link is in the chat. And then we did have a, a question um, through chat um, asking if um, Robert Simon uh, specifically uh, talked about the, the visit himself. Um, so I've pulled up um, the book about Simon in his own words by Christina Alcorn. And so I'll just read it really quickly because it's, it's quite short. But um, so he says, um, oh no, hold on. This might be somebody else. Hold on, hold on. I think I quote Jane Wilhelm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I, I thought it was him, but I think it is Jane. You're right. So, okay. So we don't have it from, from Simon. I was, I was jumping on it too quickly. Yes. Thank you, Christina. But, but I guess at least Jane Wilhelm, who we saw in the photographs um, in the presentation, she does talk about it. So, I mean, kind of the gist of it is that, uh, that she heard about it very quickly and, and came out um, to see her. And so they kind of know how it was very impromptu, but everybody kind of heard about it and came down. I wanted to ask a question about that because in my research with Jane and with Bob, it was certainly presented as though it was, they didn't know it was coming. And that Jane talks about how she got a call and said, you know, Ladybird's coming in an hour and, and how they ran around to get everything ready and that Jane was down on her hands and knees in the plaza picking weeds out between the bricks because she wanted it to be a very nice presentation. So um, when I heard the tapes, which thank you, Julia, those are amazing. The, I, I had heard the podcast before, but I hadn't gotten to the rest in part yet. So what a treat that was to hear her talk about it. But she certainly says, you know, I, I I think they knew they knew we were coming and they they may have told the press anybody have any any more insights into that if indeed bob and but see i think jane's as since she was in charge of community relations and in that role i think if anybody was going to tell the press she would have and she didn't even seem to know i had the impression mrs cheryl can you hear me i don't know is that the uh the the secret service didn't want to people to know precisely when they were coming. And that, that may have been the, the confusion about when they were coming or whatever, but I, I, do, I really don't know. But uh, I wanted to ask, I, I didn't want to introduce, are you, did you have anything else, Christina? No, I'm done. I wanted to ask what Abe Bordas's role was. Why was he there? I'm so glad you asked about that. Um, interesting he was a supreme court associate justice yes by then and but he goes way back with the johnsons as you know um and he had lady bird's trust immensely and i don't know what his relationship was with simon or with reston but you know he and his his wife too were massive art collectors he was a violinist himself she, Lady Bird Johnson, played a major role in acquiring from Joe Hirshhorn, Joe and Olga Hirshhorn, the Hirshhorn collection to be donated to the Smithsonian. And Abe was one of the interlocutors then. So I, Abe's, Abe Fortas's papers are closed at Yale and he's such an interesting character. And I, but I can't give you the actual detail of why he was there, but I suspect because he and his wife were such movers and shakers in the world of art and architecture. And, and it's possible that he helped arrange it, that he knew Simon and helped make the arrangement. I'm not really sure. I don't believe that Bordas and Simon knew each other. No, okay. I do know that, that Udall did. Udall right. and Bob were wrong. He's in the, Udall's in the photograph at the inauguration. Pardon me? Udall is in that photograph when they're, they're inaugurating the um, Reston, yeah. Bob left, left Reston, Udall um, asked him to do some work at an Indian reservation. Uh-huh. So that there was an, an ongoing relationship there, but I never heard any Fortis relationship. 
If you're curious about the Udall connection, Udall's papers are all at the University of Arizona and they're totally open and all of the finding aids are digitized as well at this point. Hi, I wanted to share a, a picture uh, if I could. Uh, my father was actually there at the tour with Jane and uh, Bob Simon, uh, Vern Walker. Um, and I have a, a photo, I, it's gonna be difficult to share here, but um, show another angle. I didn't see this one oh. in, the, uh, in the presentation, but you see- uh, I love great, that. How, how diverse it was and yeah. you know the excitement on, on the plaza. Um, I'd be happy to share this with the rest of the museum if, um, if they're interested, if there's any room for it, but I'm not sure exactly where it came from. It's always been a family treasure that we've had. That's wonderful. Yeah, we'd love to have it for a copy. Sure. Alex, I have another question. Sure. For Julia. So a lot of us are familiar with LBJ's tapes. You know, they used to play those on the weekends on WAMU. A lot of us used to listen to them and they were fantastic. Um, how did you become aware of Lady Bird's tapes and did they just recently become available? And thank you for bringing them to everybody's attention. I'm just curious about that process. Sure, I, I think of, you know, I told you, I see that image that the first slide is the two LBJs and these are the other LBJ tapes. They weren't recorded secretly the way his were, but um, they're that substantial. You know, I, worked in foreign policy for a very long time. And as Alexandra said, wrote about Cuba and Brazil and Latin America and American foreign policy. And at a certain point decided I wanted to write about women in power, but I did not have a subject. I was a woman in search of a woman. And a friend of mine told me that Lady Bird had kept a diary while she was in the White House. And that was almost 10 years ago. And in 1970, she had published a big, a big chunk 780 page collection that was only a tiny sliver of their totality. And I, it was just really timing because when I went down to the LBJ library in I guess 2014 for my first research trip, they had just begun to release the fully unredacted audio tapes and the fully unredacted transcripts of them. And, you know, the competitive juices start to flow, right? I realized pretty quickly from having read all the Caro and all the secondary source material that nobody had bothered to listen to them, to read the transcripts, to assess him in terms of her participation in his presidency or her in terms of their relationship and the decade she was living in, none of it. It just had barely been done. A couple of, I think, inadequate biographies of her had been written. And, you know, there's not just the Lady Bird tapes. It's not just that her tapes. The, the LBJ Library and a bunch of other archives around the country, including the National Archives, but, you know, the Rockefeller Holdings, Udall's Holdings, the Library of Congress, there's a lot of material on and about her. Most of it is the most important stuff being at the LBJ Library. Um, so it wasn't some discovery that, but it, in a way that it, it was because it recasts, I think, her and certainly his presidency once we kind of take on the totality of it. She says, for example, in 1966, that they, she spends two thirds of her time when talking to LBJ, talking about Vietnam. She, Vietnam is a huge issue for her. Civil rights is a huge issue for her. Riots in American cities. I mean, everything that he lived, she lived. And he was, she became, was by the time they got into the White House, but certainly over the time they were there, his absolute most important and most trusted advisor, without a doubt. Yeah, it's fascinating. Thanks for uh, making us all aware of it and of her importance to his uh, administration and his life. Sure. Well, any, any last questions? 
Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Please do check out all those resources that we talked about tonight and, and learn more. And, and thank you, Julia, for joining us tonight. It was a real treat and just really great. Thank you for having so me. Great. My pleasure. It's great to learn about Reston. I need to come out there. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Really nice to see you. Thanks, Alexandra. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy your evening. Stay cool, everybody. You too. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.